Thank you all for joining us for this discussion. I just want to make sure, can you hear us on Zoom, Dr. Mutumba and Chibuza? Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Can you hear us? Yes, we can. Great. All right, so thank you for joining us for this discussion around health technology and innovation on the continent. Um, my name is Adeyola or Yola Adeniji, and I'm a second year MBA student at Yale School of Management. Um, before starting school, I was working in health technology, and after school, we were working in healthcare venture capital. So I'm really excited to hear from you all and, of course, have this discussion here today. So before I introduce the panelists, I also wanted to get a sense of who's in the audience and just your general interest. So just by a show of hands, can you raise your hands if you're interested in health care from a clinician standpoint? So MD, nurse, okay, cool. Um, from more of an operational or like building standpoint. So okay. Cool, and then investor standpoint. Anyone here just because they didn't get into the room? <laughs> <laughs> this is a long question. <laughs> yeah, this is um, going to be a good discussion. Okay, great. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists who also have very different viewpoints and perspectives that I think they bring to this space. So um, we'll all benefit from this conversation. So I'll start with who we have on Zoom. We have Dr. Margaret Mutumba. She is a public health scholar and global health innovator with over 10 years of experience in maternal child in sexual and reproductive health in sub-Saharan Africa. Her work has focused on reducing maternal mortality, supporting youth impacted or orphaned by the HIV epidemic, and more recently addressing barriers to family forming due to infertility. Margaret is also the CEO slash co-founder of Med Atlas, which is a digital health startup whose goal is to simplify access to specialist health care in Africa. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Pharmacology from King's College London, a Master of Public Health from Imperial College London and her PhD in Public Health Sciences from the University of Waterloo, Canada. So thank you for joining us. Next, we have Dr. Chibuza Opara. He is a co-founder and CEO of Drugstop. I'm not sure if his camera is on yet, but he's also joining us virtually. Drugstop is a cloud-based pharma tech distribution platform that provides access to verified quality pharmaceutical products for healthcare facilities and professionals in Sub-Saharan Africa. He holds degrees in medicine and surgery and economics, policy and management from the University of Maastricht, Netherlands, with a passion for using tech to disrupt barriers while transforming access to quality healthcare. He challenged Nigeria to embrace technology and be among countries driving change. So welcome to the All right, in the room here we have Melanie. Melanie Okunaye, she's the co-founder of Akoma Health, which improves access to culturally conscious and high quality mental health care for Africans via teletherapy. Melanie is passionate about enabling others to fulfill their potential, thus working with individuals to be their best selves and thus impactful in their communities. Prior to Akoma, Melanie held roles in consulting and finance, working with firms in the UK and Goldman Sachs. She received her MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business, and her undergraduate degree in philosophy, philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of New York in the UK. So welcome, Melanie. Thank you. And then here, right next to me, is Maximilian Mancini. He is the co-founder and chief strategy officer at Ilara Health, which is a Nairobi-based healthcare startup empowering primary care centers across Sub-Saharan Africa to deliver better quality care to their communities. Prior to joining the early Ilara Health team, Maximilian was an investment banker focused on healthcare M&A based out of London after graduating from Columbia University as an under undergraduate in 2016. So let's welcome all of our panelists. <laughs> awesome. And while we have our discussion, you can also submit questions via Slido. So if you see that code up on the screen, you can submit your questions there. We just go on the website, type in that code, and I'm going to try to check periodically so I can incorporate that in our discussion. That way you all have a better chance to ask questions, not just me asking them. Um, so while you're thinking about your questions, I'll start with one for all of our panelists. Um, so health tech is just a very vast space. Um, there are a lot of approaches and a lot of innovations going on in that space. So that could be diagnostics, it could be new models of care, it could be platforms. So 
electronic health record systems. Which form of health tech do you think has the greatest potential for impact in Africa and why? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two satellite. Okay. Actually, yeah. Can we start with either Dr. Mutumba or Chibuzo to take that question? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So your question was what what tech play has the biggest advantage, uh, biggest reach or biggest impact uh, factor for Africa? I think the question is a very interesting one. Um, within the African space, obviously, there, there are numerous factors that would um, account for the diffusion of any tech, um, you know, any tech tech play it could be the 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 availability of the devices you know the different spaces that it would go through you know what what exactly is being leveraged within the population for it to be so it's a, it's an interesting question to consider but i think the for me the way i would look at it is that all of the different um, tech plays the ones that have the biggest um, the, the biggest spread. I think when you look at the space, the the population of people who have access to mobile phones has definitely created room for a different level of personalized care that you know would that would not necessarily have arisen you know in wealthier countries so even when you go to wealthy areas of the world one thing that people continue to see is that um the the speed at which innovation is picked up is usually in the areas where traditional healthcare has you know i don't want to use the word failed but hasn't sort of serviced people so a lot of wealthier countries are like, you know, they don't really have the need. It's kind of like with the mobile phones, right? A lot of people don't really have the need to to um, pick up mobile phones and, and you know, um, the speed at which it, 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 it sort of scaled in Africa was as a result that people didn't have that in the in their in their previous lives. So um, I think what you're looking at is across the entire healthcare um, channel. Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, I had I had some failure of technology right there. Um, <laughs> my my point was that it, it didn't. I wouldn't look at it in terms of each each technology as a vertical. I'd look at it as the entire space is there's a lot of the speed of diffusion of products services you know um it's not necessarily just due to inf there's there's reasons that impact different uh, different technologies but in in each vertical the advantage that um lower income countries have in taking up this technology is that there's really nothing that exists and so the thirst and the 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 space um, and the opportunities that exist from being able to just take advantage of just these um, leveraging any of these technologies is you know is fantastic and I think with um, with AI and with with these rapid you know, in, um, um, these rapid scale up of of text generative text um, type technologies and diagnostics. Um, I think you're in for a very interesting two years, uh, and I don't think we have scratched the surface of what what can happen with with health technology in, in lower income um, areas of the world. Great. Yeah. I'm going to not doing it as like these single verticals, but looking at the the space more broadly and the trends happening and technology and how that can be leveraged for improving care. So Dr. Matumba, can you comment on that question as well? Yes, I'll try to be as quick as possible. Um, but I echo Chibuzo's 
comments in that it depends on what infrastructure is already in place and what people are already using. So if you, depending on what context you're interested in, I would take some time to understand what infrastructure is available and how health is being, surprisingly, clinicians and patients alike are already being innovative in this space. They just need structure around how they deliver care. So for instance, with talking with physicians in my work, many of them are already using platforms like WhatsApp to consult with their patients, right? If you're talking about supply chain, if you look at examples like brands like Coca-Cola, where you can find a Coca-Cola bottle in the most remote village, it means that they have hacked the procurement piece. And so how can us as people who are interested in healthcare, people who are interested in technology, learn from other industries that have already um, been able to, should I say, take advantage of whatever whatever is available. So for instance, in East Africa, people use motorbikes a lot. So if you're thinking about health tech, does an ambulance make sense in a context where people move on motorbikes? So I'll say for technologies in Africa, we don't want to just carry what's happening in North America or Europe and plant it on the ground. Do your own research, see what's happening, understand the culture that's there, and then think about how whatever health technology you're interested in can fit into that context. And so it really varies. Are we talking about specialist healthcare? Are we talking about access to primary healthcare? We've seen pharmacies now providing delivery services for themselves because they're seeing the demand, right? We're seeing diagnostics as a huge thing. So you have all these little corner shops in different parts of African communities where someone can go and self-diagnose for malaria. So if you're thinking about diagnostic devices and tests, these things are already happening. And so it's a matter of understanding that and taking advantage of all the development that's already happening on the continent. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Context is key. I think we're gonna probably hit on that. Conversation, yeah. Yeah, I was quite similarly going to say something around um, the institutions that exist, uh, but also potentially the lack of education that exists for um, healthcare more broadly. And I think that's something that is very different in Africa compared to, for example, fintech. Um, you have a lot of people that, you know, Dr. Matumba mentioned that some people self diagnose for malaria, actually thinking it's malaria when it could actually be a suite of other things without going to a doctor. You have people that, you know, I'm specifically working in the mental health space, who are going to consider that, you know, someone has a mental health issue, oh, they must have been taking drugs. Or, you know, there's so many different things where that are lacking from a public health standpoint, um, and also lacking from an institutional standpoint where so many people may not have access to a hospital within 50 miles of them, if not more. Um, and so I think what exists for Africa is not necessarily specific, similar to other people, a specific industry per se, where there can be the most innovation, but I think it's the how and the ability to leapfrog much of the um, institutional, um, many of the institutions that exist in the healthcare space in Africa. So, you know, where there are people maybe still investing in hospitals and stuff, so, so and so on now, I think there really is the opportunity to leapfrog by having a bunch of health tech companies that you know people are more naturally suited for in the space that um, in, where people have phones, they moved, for example, in Nigeria out of Lagos since the pandemic, or more of, like so many of my team actually don't work in Lagos. Um, they finished university in Kogi State, in Kanu, and many other parts of Nigeria, and they're able to work remotely for a bunch of these tech companies. And those people are similarly looking for uh, mental health care, looking for primary health care, and many other things like that. So. I think um, those two things can really, um, in terms of education and in terms of technology, can really um, push uh, the boundary and innovate people, the way people can access care and the the more, like the greater suite of healthcare products and services that they have access to. Yeah, the top M information you're providing to the patient. Yeah. Yeah, maybe a brief point to tie it off. Um, going back to some of the two themes touched upon by Dr. Margaret and Chibuzo. I think it's worth trying to think about healthcare again as a bit of an infrastructure play and really understanding that taking a verticalized approach where there is basic infrastructure missing is, you know, complete in and of itself. You know, it's very difficult to be a pure play diagnostics player if then nobody's addressing the therapeutic side. 
It's very difficult to address the therapeutic side if you're unable to provide the right innovation from a clinical care delivery side. So I think it's it's a hard question to really think about the single vertical innovation that has you know, the potential for greatest impact. You can really achieve that impact through some level of you know, partnership and working together, having multiple players in the ecosystem, leveraging their respective strengths and taking a more ecosystem-based approach to the whole issue of, of delivering better care. That's great. I want to like zoom in on like the infrastructure piece and how you all navigate that. And actually, it, it kind of ties into a question that we've got. Just a reminder to submit your questions. I think we'll put the code on the, the board just so you can access it. Um, but Francis was asking if you all could talk a bit more about your background and how that enabled you to navigate challenges while building out your, your companies at the early stage. Um, and I think if you can also hit on like the infrastructure piece, right? Like there are other factors to consider when building out a healthcare company um, in a country in Africa, and you have to balance those needs with also, um, you know, potential gaps that exist in broader infrastructure. So how did you all navigate that and think about that? Happy to do the first time. Yep. Um, I mean, from a background standpoint, I'm, I'm not a doctor. I didn't really come from a healthcare background. The closest I really got to was advising you know, large healthcare corporates on transformational and innate deals in the Western world. So taking out a little bit of a pinch of salt when it comes to you know, contextualization of the content. But I think what that really gave me was a deep appreciation of what does innovation in the West look like and how can you leverage that to leapfrog healthcare systems in underdeveloped markets. You have you know, phenomenal innovations bringing down the cost of diagnostics, really helping in the delivery of clinical care through digital health tools. You find these novel payer models that are really unlocking all the efficiencies in the world. How can you take those learnings and package them in such a way as to build new healthcare systems in you know, emerging market contexts? And if I think about the early in our health days, our model was really enabled by what was going on in the diagnostic space. We would take color technologies such as Butterfly Networks Ultrasound, a $2,000 ultrasound probe, call it about a fifth to tenth cheaper than your more traditional large card based systems. At that price point, you can find sustainable financing products to enable local clinicians to really access and use that device itself. So that background really helped me when identifying, understanding, being aware of innovations out there and finding ways to package them for that Kenyan and broader sub Saharan African context in my mind. Um so yeah, I guess I'll ask the question next. Um so in terms of can you already what the questions? Yeah, so the it was kind of a two-part question. So yeah. I'm, I'm trying to squeeze in a lot. Um <laughs> so what about your background do you think uniquely positioned you for building out a company at the early stage and then how do you think about infrastructure and balancing that too? Yeah, okay, thank you. So uh, my background was very broad, weird and wonderful, wonderful thing, but uh, all led me to healthcare. And so for me, when I was building, when I started building Acoma Health, I was thinking more so about my passions um, and what I, the impact I wanted to have on the world as opposed to my own technical skills. And so for me, I realized my through line was um, the helping others fulfill their full potential. And for me, I realized that a lot of that was lacking in the terms of mental health care for Africans. Um, and so I had done a lot of venture investing. I'd spent a lot of time in finance, also investing in healthcare. Um, in venture, I was dealing with a lot of consumer companies as well as wellness companies and so on. And the more and more I was seeing these companies, the more I realized that there were so many demographics, including demographics that I fitted into that were being left out of the equation that come people were building companies for. And so my passion led me to start thinking about people like myself um, and realize what I could build for that. And that led me to the user research journey, which led to what we now have as a common health. Um, but in terms of institutions and how we've leveraged institutions, I think one key thing um, that I learned from analyzing a lot of um, you know, successful um, companies and startups in Africa were that they quite often had an anchor partner that um, led them to um, at least gather information, at least um, operationalize quickly, or um, you know, just whatever it was they needed within that, that ecosystem, it pushed them forward. And so for us, 
we have our anchor partner in Nigeria, which is uh, Lagoon Hospitals. They're one of the um, largest hospital chains in Nigeria. And we work with them essentially to establish uh, better mental health care for a number of their patients. But we work with a number of other institutions and employers across Nigeria. Um, we're working with some in Ghana um, and in early talks with some in Zimbabwe and South Africa as well. Um, and I think that what is really missing is that I, um, the statistic is there's something like 1.2 mental health professionals for every 100,000 people across Africa. Um, in Nigeria specifically, there are 300 psychiatrists for over 200 million people. Um, and uh, much of that 1.2 is like 70% of that are actually mental health nurses, not actually doctors, psychologists, and so on. Um, and so given the huge lack there, there is a real need um, for mental health professionals that we are vetting, we're testing the policy for, we're putting them on one place because no one knows where to find a psychologist really or even the difference between a psychologist and a therapist. And so essentially the institutions exist and we're um, adding a layer on top of that to really provide access to mental health care, to improve physical health outcomes um, and also to um, prevent um, many cases of, um, of suicide and worse where uh, like six out of the ten top countries for suicide prevalence are in Africa. So um, the statistics are quite glaring and the need is very glaring and um, we are essentially trying to work with what already exists to improve and from there we will continue to figure out how we can build institutions of our own that are existing. Chibuza, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well, because I just think the nature of drug stop, you, you probably have to think a lot about infrastructure and leveraging your um, both clinical and like managerial background and into figuring that out. So um, how did you approach that? Thank you. Um, OK, so I'll take the infrastructure question first. Um, so. Okay, I'll you're back. <laughs> except, except you want to, you know, you want to get some drones and things like that, which, which is another way, you know. But I think my experience in the, in the space in terms of infrastructure has been around, um, or in terms of deploying tech around infrastructure, is that what I've found that has been the most fascinating thing with innovation and introducing technology has never really been about the technology. See, the, the software folks, the engineers, the product managers, they exist in a bubble, right? They go, they speak to these, they speak to the consumers, the clients, and come back with these really brilliant ideas, and then we release a product or a feature, feature, and the client then takes that feature or product and then does what they want with it. And that is actually where the innovation happens, when the client takes your product. So that conversation between your company, the client, and the product is where the innovation really happens. And what do I mean by this? Um, so I'll give you a practical example. When we, um, when we release our product first, we were like, you know, hey guys, you can order this product, you know, by going on our platform and signing in as hospital pharmacy, order it and you get this product delivered to you within 24 hours. And so when people got it first, they were like, yeah, what, 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 what do you guys do? What, what is this? What is this? They don't, they don't get it. But what, what we found was people were just like using our product to compare prices. And so we started then to have the conversation around um, pricing and linking that to, to care outcomes and things like that, you know, and equity in healthcare. And people started to, to, to pick up the product uh, uh, faster. What I see that technology does, right, is introduce the plasticity um, or it introduces plasticity in the ecosystem, the thinking in the ecosystem. So people are more willing to think about how to do things differently. Um, so prior to you know introduction of a, a cloud-based inventory management system that is back-ended into a supplier's inventory and everybody's able to predict and and plan stock taking, you know you could easily do that easily with 
with phones and text messages and all that. But having that system real life on people's phones and having it widespread and transparent and everybody seeing the, the inventory and the patients being able to also have, you know, um, real time access to all that medication sort of changes the, the, the conversation that that people are having around um, access to pharmaceuticals, access to care, access to services. And you introduce several other ways that people can interact with your service. So at the heart of driving this change, one thing is introduce it, like seeing a gap in the market, pursuing that gap, and almost sort of leading your space, leading the players, the stakeholders in that space um, towards the realization that, hey, this is a different way to do things. It might, all, it might not always go the way you thought it would go, but um, you know this this would push um, um, new ways of thinking, new ways of doing things, new ways of seeing infrastructure gaps, new ways of seeing um, lack of resources, and letting people sort of handle the 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 the, the you know the leaps in in those innovative thinking and processes around that. Um, I hope that's clear because I in my head it sounds really coherent. Um, but but um, um, I, I, and I'll, I'll I'll talk about my background and and, and how that sort of um, I, I have a counterculture type thinking with regards to you know background and, and and entrepreneurship. To be honest, I don't think there's anything in my background that sort of prepared me for that first year. In, in starting a company, I think the most important quality you, you need to have as a founder, at least in, Af in the African healthcare space, um, is just tenacity and persistence. Um, maybe between the maybe between 2018 and 2021, you could say you know access to cheap capital would give you a, a, a mileage. But I think we're back to the lean years again. And, and, and now you just need to be um, tenacious and, and just keep pushing, chasing, you know, find out what your true north is and just keep going. And, and typically the market, the market, after a while, the market listens to you, you know? I mean, obviously you need to know when you're barking up the wrong tree, but um, it's, it, I, I would say that, that the most important quality in my background was just being stubborn in, in moving these innovations. I, I remember people laughing at us like, you know, what are you talking about ordering pharmaceuticals online? Are you guys the Yahoo Boys? What are you talking about? This is never going to be pulled up. Yahoo Boys is a 409 in Nigeria. 409 is actually advanced fee fraud. It's, um, it's, so anyways, the, the, I think in the later, in, 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 as the company got more mature, then the skills I picked up, my, cl my clinician skills came into play. My um, skills I, I picked up in the finance world came into play. But those first few years, I mean, I was my own HR, my own doorman, my own delivery guy, my own everything. So I don't know that there was any one particular thing that I would say really helped me through those uh, first two years. I guess my fiance and my wife uh, at, at now, my fiance at the time probably, uh, keeping me sane also uh, helped me a lot. But yeah, I think I would say persistence is is really what, you know, the first one or two years um, um, takes you over that edge to, to position you for success. That's great. That's similar to what uh, Melanie and I were talking about earlier about when you're building a company for the first time, sometimes you start sort of questioning, like, why don't I know how to do this? Or like, how do I figure this out? But it is that tenacity and to also just recognize like this is my first time running a company <laughs> or building a company obviously i have to learn along the way so um thank you dr matumba i'd love to to hear your take on this question too where we take it sure I'll, i will really just summarize what all the amazing panelists have said is that you you find your passion while you are already in doing something, right? So for me, I was already managing fertility hospitals. It was never my intention to start a company, but I loved what I did. I loved the patients that I was interacting with. And I saw a gap. I saw a problem, right? That could have been, that could be solved with technology. And so like the rest of the panelists mentioned, you know, that is when I decided, okay, I want to pursue this. 
fortunate for me, I was ignorant. Um, I'm a very straight science sort of person. And so I was very new to the entrepreneurship space. And I think that helped me because I addressed issues as they arose. But for sure, if you want to um, address health challenges in Africa, like Chibun, Chibuzo said, you have to be, you have to have tenacity. You have to be open-minded and flexible because there's limited structures there. So you have to be open to, you know, failing, talking to a few people, trying different things. I love what was said about partnerships. It's not one of those things that you can go in it alone. You Because as was said earlier, there's a whole array of opportunities for us to address, whether it's diagnostics, whether it's therapeutics, whether it's management. So for a company to be successful, the more you can establish partnerships that are doing well along that chain, the stronger and, and, and the more impactful what you're doing becomes. The goal for us at the end of the day is in, to improve healthcare, to improve access to healthcare. And so doing that together is very important. And there's so many diseases and opportunities for other folks to come in and, and help in this space. So I really encourage us to do that as well. Awesome. I want to um, go back to the point you made earlier, Dr. Matumba, about context and nuance. Because um, I know that with MedAtlas, your company, you're looking to um, connect people to specialty uh, doctors, and that's across Africa. So, how have you thought about um, the regulatory, operational, cultural nuances that exist in across the various countries within the continent? Um, and then, what partnerships or or sort of other strategies have you leveraged to be able to to do that? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, on our side, because we prioritize very sensitive and stigmatized uh, conditions for MedAtlas, we've had to be very cautious about cultural, being able to communicate culturally appropriately. So if you're talking about something like fertility, um, you're bringing in the taboo topic of sexual and reproductive health. And I'll give you two examples. In East Africa, for instance, you have Uganda and Tanzania. Tanzania is predominantly Muslim. And Uganda is predominantly Christian. And so I found in our work that the T Tanzanian context is very culturally conservative. And so when you're talking about things like infertility, they want to hear from women. They don't want to hear from male fertility specialists because they're very delicate issues that they would prefer to speak to a female gynecologist about, right? So in providing and promoting our service there, we would push more of our female gynecologists. Whereas what we found in Uganda is that people weren't as bothered. They just wanted to solve their infertility issue. And I could say the same for mental health, for instance, um, with, with, with what you're doing, for instance. Older people might be less inclined to pursue mental health care because maybe culturally speaking, that mental health support was provided by a mother, an aunt, a grandma, right? Whereas younger people are facing different challenges. I know on the African continent, now, for instance, drug addiction is becoming a very significant issue. And so young people might be more willing to leverage technology and speak to a stranger. I know for older people, they say, why are you telling a stranger your problems? You know, these are insider things, right? Whereas younger people are more open to it. So really, even when we're thinking about cultural context, people might come from the same culture, but even the age demographic will determine who would want to access your type of service. So sometimes, again, you, you might not cover the whole, should I say, demographic, the whole age range. You have to start somewhere and focus on the group that's accepting because ultimately they will talk to those other groups that are a bit more hesitant and you see your company grow in that way. So don't be deterred just because maybe it's just uh, high schoolers who are using um, your product. They could talk to their parents and then it could scale in that way. But definitely context is important. Otherwise, you might find challenges in terms of acceptability of whatever it is that you're trying to offer. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, understanding your audience and like what, what you said about um, even within a certain group, the demographics and other factors that can be at play, I think is a really important point. Um, we have another question from the audience. I think it was one 
specifically for Melanie, and it's actually related to the cultural uh, aspect of, of mental health and possibly it being still being thought of as a taboo topic. Um, so Jessica asked, how do you think of institutions like religion and traditional medicine where people also go for mental health when it comes to expanding access? Yeah, very good question because it is something we thought about a lot in our early stages. Um, I'm trying to think how best to structure the answer. So very much how Dr. Matova said, there is a way that you need to start and prioritize. So there's just so many different ways to solve mental health and so many different places to go to, so many different types of people. You can't even generalize across Africa, within Africa, even within one city, because different age groups, different socioeconomic things and so on. And so when I think specifically about religion, um, I think that Interestingly, in our user interviews at the very early stages, we found that um, younger people didn't want to have any religious um, uh, religious ties in their mental health, um, in their therapy, and in any of their mental health solutions. We, however, there are a few that wouldn't see a therapist unless it was related to the church or the mosque or whichever religious leaning they had. Um, but that was a very small minority, and so we decided we weren't going to build that into our product. Um, when we um, were speaking about, uh, I think it's, um, what was the word you use, like native medicine? Yes, yeah, traditional, traditional medicine. Traditional medicine. So we, that's something else we also thought about, um, and it is, again, very specifically talking to a specific audience, but we found that that wasn't necessarily the same audience that was also our target market. And so when we're thinking about who our target market is for us at this time, those are um, 18 to 35 year olds very loosely, um, or already living in urbanized cities, and we really say urbanized just to say that they have access to technology in a very um, easy way, um, so they can do teletherapy. Um, and a lot of those people are already employed at organizations that will pay for their therapy as well, um, given that we have um, a number of employer partners that are um, essentially our customers directly. Um, and so that makes our starting market smaller than everyone, but it makes us very targeted and specific in what we can do because at the end of the day, we are startups, we have very limited resources. If we're going for everyone, we don't have enough people to work on all these different types of people who might have a very different suite of user experience problems and may need new features that our engineers would have to build for. Um, so I think it's a really good question. I think it's something we think about when we're expanding um, and when we're marketing to different audiences and when we think about language. Um, and I, I really like that point that Dr. Mutombo talks about when it comes to language and how you speak about different things to different audiences. Um, and I think this almost boils down to the education point too because um, I, I can tell you firsthand, I have um, friends who experience mental health crises in the US um, of African descent, whose parents sent them to, you know, Nigeria for the first time to go to MFM camp, I don't know if anyone knows what MFM camp is here, um, to go to one week of prayer. Um, and <laughs> and um, he kind of, le he left eventually because the pastor finally let him go. Um, but it's just to say that there is a level of education that needs to happen um, in many different spheres. And I think that one thing I love about the healthcare industry in Nigeria or in Africa broadly is that there are a lot of people building very different solutions for almost the same problem. Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing because we're all working together to bring more light to a number of different issues that exist. And I think the more that we can do that, the more that we can help each other to increase our market size. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, I think rather than thinking of it as like, what is the one perfect solution for this issue, it's actually good to have that suite of offerings yeah. and to, to work together with others on that. Um, I think we're getting close to time, but I'm just going to keep going until we get <laughs> yeah, we have 12 minutes. Okay. Oh, perfect. Um, we have another question that I think um, Max and Shibuja, I'd love to get your, your perspective on. Um, how are you thinking about convincing medical specialists or maybe just providers in general to join your network or to, to leverage your, your product? What are your respective arguments for, for making the case to them? It's, um, it's a great question and you know, not, not the simplest of ones. Um, I think in our case, you know, it's helpful to go back to the very, very, very early in our health days um, when we actually came up with our first idea of business model. And 
this really came off the back of walking from clinic to clinic to clinic on the outskirts of Nairobi, speaking to clinicians, owners, pharmacists, and equivalents, really asking them, yeah, what do you need? What's missing? What do you need to grow your business as a small facility? What do you need as a clinician to deliver better care? And really try to understand what those pain points were. And yeah, we had lots of different answers. We need more capital for a full stock of medicines. We may need systems because we have this pile of papers that's all over the place and we lose all of our information related to our clinics and our patients. And the one that you know, really, really got us was we, we do not have a laboratory. And what this really meant was they see patients walking into these small community centers. Think of these as three, four rooms, small micro facilities, mom and pop medical shops, if you will. They might request basic tests, out an ultrasound, very basic blood tests, and the response tends to be, we don't have them. We do not have the ultrasound. We do not have the hematology analyzer. We do not have you know, your A1C analyzer. Um, please go elsewhere to that public facility that's two hours away or to that private facility that might be nearby but is way too expensive anyway given your term demographic. So that really became our you know, aha moment where we said, cool, we see there's a gap. We know there are technologies out there around the world that can enable some level of uptake with the right type of financing within these facilities. Let us now bring them in country and try to place them within these facilities. So all of this is a really long-winded you know, preamble to say our approach when we walk into a clinic is to say, we have an ultrasound. You can pay for this ultrasound with fixed installments over a two to three year period. You can deliver better care to your community, which definitely resonates, but at the same time, you can grow your business because all of those mothers that you've been turning away on a monthly basis, you can now offer the solution to, you can now offer the service to. And when you're telling that clinician who's both a clinician and an entrepreneur, this is the person who runs the business, who has that business mindset, you can both grow your business and deliver better healthcare. It becomes a you know somewhat compelling argument. Uh, so really yeah, trying to understand what drives the owner, what drives a decision maker, and shaping the product around them. And that's really our, our approach to, uh, to setting our devices or financing our devices. I love that you went out to ask what are the different needs. Like, you know, just to, to actually hear from those obviously that you're serving, it seems very obvious, but you'd be surprised as to people just thinking, oh, this seems like a, a solution people need. You yeah, know? And, and I think on, on that point, also, just very quickly, this is something very contextual of operating on the content. It's very hard to sit down, open up, you know, whichever which research paper or news yeah. article or you name it, and understand your mind. There's very little data, there's very little accessibility to information when sitting behind a you know, laptop. So as banal as it sounds, really going out into the field, speaking to your end customers, users, or equivalents, really learning by doing and doing that homework yourself is absolutely necessary to build something in, in our context. Yeah. I just I even want to double down on that real quick and just say that on top of tenacity that has already been mentioned and stubbornness and many other things, I think everyone on the panel has somewhat indicated to not knowing or you know realizing that they didn't know. And I think that's something that I just particularly love in the founder seat that the more you experience, the more you're okay with being like, you know what, I'm just not even gonna make any assumptions here mm, and just yeah, out. go find out myself and learn on the on ground mm -hmm. um, and still continue to know, never feel like you have the ultimate answer. So mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah, yeah for sure. Chibuza, I'd love to get your your thoughts on how you um, convince providers and, and other players to use your your product. So, um, I mean, the customer journey for 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 drug stock is um, initially. So, so when we started, right, we had a network of about twenty facilities, and now we work at over three thousand um, healthcare facilities, and um, in some sub national state governments, I think. Every player is kind of different. You, you kind of need to speak to every player's needs. Um, you want to understand what their pain points are and, and speak to those pain points. And, um, you know, understand how they are going to use your technology um, and use your, and, and, and what, what they are trying to solve. Um, there's a lot of, 
there's a lot of cross talking in the space um, where you so so it's it's very interesting that in, in in hospitals right they typically don't the 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 innovation diffusion in in the healthcare space is very interesting. When you're talking to hospital managers, they are sometimes the purchasers of the technology are not necessarily the people who use the technology. And sometimes the people who um, have the budget decision don't really have time to, or don't have, they have a limited amount of bandwidth to absorb you know, complex technology. So depending on how familiar they are with your technology or how commonplace, you know, what they what you're bringing to them, I think you craft your message in that way. And, you know, oftentimes it, it helps to meet them in their spaces where they're open to, to listening to you and uh, things like that. Um, Typically, with hospital managers, you want to help them save money, and with with pharmaceutical businesses, you want to help them make money, and um, that's really very simple um, um, conversations in that space. Um, with clinicians, you want to work with them on impact, and with um, you know with with a lot of other healthcare professionals who. Uh, in the in the healthcare value chain, but not necessarily, um, you know, interfacing with the with the patient. We probably would be looking at efficiency, time savings, and things like that. Um, I think physicians are very supply side. Um, their, their thinking is very supply side. Very, you know, I want to give the patient all. I want to give the patient more. So oftentimes, like, it's it's tough to, you know, have conversations around efficiency with physicians. Um, I mean, those are starting to happen. Places like the NHS are having healthcare trust managers sort of manage what, what services are coming out of healthcare systems and things like that. But I would say that you really sort of have to segment not just the, um, the, the, the space that you're speaking to, but almost sort of speak to the specific need of the person that you're pitching and understand who actually has the purchasing decision, who has the budget decision, who has the um, adoption decision, who has, I mean, it's healthcare systems and businesses and institutions are, you know, vastly complex and you sort of have to understand all that value chain side. Yeah, that's been my experience. Yeah, I think you you hit on this the different players in the space, and I'm also realizing everybody on this panel is is addressing a different consumer type. So Melanie and um, Martyr around the, the patient themselves, and then um, with the R, uh, what Max is working on the, the provider, and then Chibuza is looking at the provider as well as hospital managers, pharmaceutical companies. So there are lots of different customers that you can consider um, or players to to address when you're thinking about building a health tech, which I think is really cool. So. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we probably have time for one more question, which I saw one come in around the regulatory environment um, and policies. So. How do you all think about regulation, health and policies, and how that can be used to improve and support the success of health technology solutions? Um, and Dr. Matumbo, can we, can we start with you on this one? Sure, um, that's a great question. And again, it comes down to what your service is that you are delivering. So for us in the digital health space at the moment, um, there's limited regulation around it. And you have to understand that we're dealing with a context at the moment where there's a lot of brain drain. A lot of our healthcare practitioners are leaving the continent. And so if you're thinking from a policy perspective um, and you're dealing with telehealth where you're trying to increase uh, access to specialist knowledge, um, how can you restrict that when the expertise is, is limited on the ground, right? 
And so there is limited regulation, but what we are doing is we work with lawyers um, in the digital health space that are well-versed and keeping up to date with what's happening. The great thing about being an innovator is that you can be part of the policy forming process. That's really the exciting part. And so if you are um, smart about it, build relationships with decision makers in this space, um, build relationships with whoever the stakeholders would be and that would impact what you're, you're working on and work with them to develop policies that obviously, first of all, prioritize whoever your target market is, but also have limited impact or actually even enhance what you're trying to deliver. And so that's the difference between the African space and many of these Western contexts where the regulation is already established. You know, it's, it's very difficult. It's very tight. You have an opportunity to be part of that process. And to be fair, our regulatory infrastructure needs that. We need that, that you know, technical know-how to develop um, many of the regulations and, and the innovation that's going to be taking place on the continent. What that means, though, is you have to build cautiously. For instance, in our company, we what we try to do is to emulate the regulatory infrastructure of Canada because that's where we're registered. And so we know that at the end of the day, once the regulation, if the regulation does come into play, we are already operating at an international standard. So that gives us, gives us be a better position to not be as impacted by the technology. So if from the from the start you can operate in a way that meets those international standards. I think it puts you in a better position and you're also able to help the different contexts to develop their own locally relevant policies as well. That's such a, a helpful mindset to have as a founder where I think rather than viewing it as, oh, there's no regulation or, or infrastructure around that, viewing it as, oh, I can partner with legislators and, and others in this space to build the policies that support this. So um, I thought that was really insightful. Melanie, I'd love to get your thoughts given um, the legislation that's been happening around mental health in Africa. Yeah. So how are you thinking about that? Yeah, it's really interesting because I would say there's two different things. There's the existence of um, policy and legislation and there's the implementation. And those can be two different things in two completely different things across Africa. And so um, I think I would think from at least what I've experienced so far, I feel like South Africa probably has the gold standard of them specifically for mental health. So for example, if someone is diagnosed with a mental illness in South Africa, they have to be um, put in a psychiatric institution for 21 days, paid for by the health insurer. The health insurer has to provide some level of mental health care support, um, and that's fully um, integrated in the way that encourages preventative care. That's not necessarily true in the rest of Africa. Um, in the rest of Africa, for example, specifically dealing with um, non-psychiatrists, you are able to offer mental health care across borders, which is not true in the US. Um, but how we think about it is, um, and honestly, I think how a lot of um, companies think about it in a number of different spaces, um, where there's not high levels of implementation of, um, of leg legislation, um, you have to just try and work with those institutions in the same way that Dr. Matumba mentioned. Um, but also, and this might be quite Nigeria specific, these institutions can really waste your time. And you don't have, um, you know, <laughs> they really can waste your time. So I've heard of um, fintech founders who have tried to work with government to build certain features, finally get the government contracts, maybe you get a bit of money with it, but then the government never uses it or they build a competing product or there's just so many different things. So I think um, that I personally feel like for us, we're thinking of the government play as a later stage thing, if at all, and if it happens to work with what we're building, but we're not going to build to work with them because they change every four years and we're hoping to <laughs> exist longer than that. So, um, but I do think there are ways that you think about it. Like for example, that, um, having that gold standard, we very much think about our um, we very much think about our data in the same way that they think about data in healthcare in the US. We very much care about those things. We very much care about privacy standards. Um, we very much care about quality care, quality assurance um, practices. Um, and we want to make sure that whoever has a good experience on our app has a good enough experience that they we retain them. We don't want to lose them because of something that we could have easily avoided um, by making sure that we have the right systems in place. Um, and just to speak to the specific point, there are a number of 
um, mental health care legislation is coming out uh, across Africa, from Zimbabwe to Nigeria, who just had the National Health uh, Mental Health Care Act in January this year. Um, many of these um, have the right idea. They are not sure how they're going to be implemented as of yet, but this is definitely where we come in. Um, and it is really exciting times, and I think that alone can do a lot to add infrastructure to the space um, in a way that doesn't currently exist. So we're very excited about this, um, very excited to see where we can add value uh, in that space. And um, I, and I, I just want to note specifically there are, I think about 80% of African countries do have some mental health care legislation, but only 30% of them or less have mental health care practices for adolescents and children. So they're very much left out of that discussion and they're still the future. Um, and so we definitely need to be thinking about that as well. Are we at time? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> this has been great. Um, I, I'm sure everybody else has gotten a lot of a lot of insights. I definitely have. So I want to thank all the panelists just for taking time out to I think you you've heard like about the challenges which are very real around innovating in healthcare in Africa, but I hope you're also super aware about the opportunities and excited to go out and fix all of them. So, um, I'll leave you all with that, but thank you all for being here as well and choosing to attend this again. Thank you. Bye, thank you.